Okay, so today we're continuing our series called Transcendent. We've been looking for signposts for God, trying to figure out fingerprints of God in the world. This is especially helpful, I think, if you're somebody who is new to faith or struggles with faith, because the Bible is a little bit uh, circular reasoning. If the Bible's not true, then what the Bible says about itself doesn't really help us much. If the Bible is true, then of course that makes a big difference. So we're, we've been looking outside of just the scripture to find things in the world that point us to something beyond, something uh, transcendent. And today we're going to take kind of a weird angle on that. We're going to talk about the topic of suffering. So if you're somebody who has been in a suffering situation now or previously, you've, you've lost someone close to you, you've faced a major uh, diagnosis or illness, you've had wayward relationships, you've had, you know what suffering looks like. I don't need any introduction to you. If you're somebody who's never suffered, uh, then I'll try to make this message really give you a glimpse of what suffering feels like, and we can all suffer for a few minutes here together, and uh, I'll do my best to make that a, a reality. Suffering is a real problem for people who are skeptical of faith. I mean, it's just kind of the elephant in the room. I just put it out there. We're a candid church. If there's an all-powerful God who cares about us, then why do people suffer? I mean, is it because he's not all-powerful? Like, he wants to fix it but can't? Or is it because he just doesn't care that much? He could fix it, he just doesn't choose to. Like, like what's that all about? Why, how can we have an all-powerful God who cares about us, who also then allows suffering? You know, the ironic thing about this, there's no silver bullet answer that explains all the nuances of suffering. The Bible talks about it extensively, and we'll look at some today. But the ironic thing is that people sometimes struggle with the existence and nature of God because of suffering. How can this be true? But when people are going through suffering, it's in those moments they look to God maybe the most. Maybe they look to God for help. Maybe they shake their fist at God in anger. But suffering cries out that this world is not all there is. There's something more. There has to be some plan. There, it can't just be random chance processes. It can't just be survival of the fittest. There has to be more. Suffering points us to something that's transcendent and beyond and above. There just has to be more there. And in fact, there's been studies on this. Those who are suffering are often the most religious. Just one example from our recent current events this past weekend. Nashville made the national news when a half-dressed man entered an Antioch Waffle House with a gun, began to shoot people. One of the, the patrons of the restaurant, James Shaw, wrestled the gun out of his hand and it was immediately hailed as a hero for saving the lives of those who would have been lost. Shaw, when he was interviewed, said, I'm not a hero. Actually, I was, he was very candid. He said, I was just trying to protect myself. I just wanted to get out of there. I wasn't really thinking about anybody else. I just wanted to get out of there myself. And so Sunday morning, just a few hours after the shooting, before, before all the national media descended, he'd gone to the hospital, gotten his wounds bandaged up. He leaves there, had so many opportunities to do or talk to people wanting his attention. Where did he go? Went to church. And he later said of this, if you would ask me, I'm not actually a great, greatly religious person, but I know that in a tenth of a second, something was with me to run through that door and get the gun from him. He said he just knew. There had to be something else. Something was driving those moments. In the middle of our worst sorts of suffering, we know that there's something more, something beyond, something transcendent. On December 14th, 2012, a 20-year-old man killed his mother, and then he drove to Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, where he shot and killed 26 people. 20 of the 26 were 6- and 7-year-old innocent children. 20 Six- and seven-year-old kids. Horrible. A few weeks later, Samuel Friedman from the New York Times wrote about the event in Newtown. And he said, it's interesting that Newtown, which Connecticut's not exactly the center of the Bible Belt, every single person he found in those, who was impacted by those events turned to faith. Every one, he said. Each and every family, 26 victims, each and every family had a religious service to honor the, their loved one who had fallen. President Obama came to speak and delivered a eulogy that, that uh, Friedman said was more like a sermon, where he said that God had called the children home and then quoted extensively from the Bible, especially 2 Corinthians 4 and 5. Friedman says that secular Connecticut became a place of deep faith in those days and weeks that followed. Somehow, suffering points us to something more, something beyond, something transcendent. You see, the real problem with suffering is not that it's philosophical. The problem with suffering is that it's personal. It hurts. It's real. It's deep. It's pressing. It's not some abstract concept for some of you today. It may be for others, but for some of you, you know what it feels like because you're in the middle of it now. It's immediate, and it's pressing, and it's difficult. And when we're suffering, we're not typically debating philosophical questions. We're just wondering how to get through these moments. 
How do I survive until the next day and the next? So today, as much as I would enjoy spending 30 or 40 minutes talking about philosophy, so if you have those questions, let's talk. I enjoy that conversation. I'm going to really try to <laughs> contain myself and point more to what the Bible says about suffering and how it is we get through it. Because it, it, there needs to be something more. If you're in the middle of this today, let me invite you to three very specific challenges. If you're not in the middle of this today, I would invite you to lodge this in your head because suffering comes to all of us. And maybe these are things that will be helpful to you down the road. Number one, I want to challenge you to surrender your right to know why it is you're suffering. You know, when a devastating illness comes or an unexpected financial crisis hits or we get the pain of abandonment from someone we love, in those moments and when we're in pain, the question why comes right to the top. Why is this happening to me? Why is God allowing it? Why is there such pain in the world? And sometimes, for me, sometimes I get an answer. Sometimes, either immediately or shortly after, I'll be like, oh, this is what was happening. This is what was going on. This makes sense. Other times, my search for answers is like chasing a rabbit trail that never really comes to a conclusion. And I wander around asking why, and I'm never satisfied. So I want to challenge you, I want to challenge us, to surrender our right to know it is, why it is that we're suffering. Look what Scripture says in Romans 5. Romans 5 says, We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us, because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. It says that our hope in the middle of suffering will not lead to disappointment. And we can be confident in that hope because God has demonstrated His love for us. Do you see that there in the middle of the passage? He doesn't tell us why. He doesn't answer that question. And He doesn't even say, if you pursue the question of why, you'll ultimately get it answered. He doesn't tell us that either. That's not true. But He says if we pursue hope, if we pursue Him, that hope will not disappoint, disappoint us. And I, I want to confess something to all of you. This may not be true for anybody else but me. But I can be a little bit arrogant in my vantage point in the middle of these moments. This may not be true for you. It is true for me. Because when I'm going through a hard time, when I'm suffering, I try to find the answers of why God will allow me to face it. And sometimes I have an aha moment. Okay, God must be doing this, or this must be happening. And it makes sense. And I, okay, yeah, Eureka. Other times I look, and I look, and I pray, and I look, and I can't seem to find an answer. And it's in those moments that my arrogance kicks in. Because I, I begin to question God. I say, God, where are you at? What are you doing? I mean, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Clearly, God, your favorite child, why are you allowing this to happen to me? Because if I can't understand the question, clearly there's not an answer. If I can't understand it, but that's a little bit arrogant. You know, the Bible says God is bigger than me. He's higher than me and stronger than me and wiser than me. So just because I can't think of a good answer doesn't mean there's not a good answer. It just means I can't think of it. In fact, if the Bible's true, which I believe that it is, that God is bigger than me and higher than me and wiser than me, there would certainly be a range of, okay, I can understand these things. It would certainly be possible there might be something that's more complicated than I can understand, but still less complicated than God's range. God can still handle it, right? I mean, if he's bigger than me and wiser than me and smarter than me, just because I can't think of the answer doesn't mean there's not an answer. Now, let me explain it to you this way. This, this may help. How many of you are fans of algebra? Like six of you. Very good. For the rest of you, how many of you aren't sure why math has letters? Anybody? <laughs> yes. Okay. So let me give you an algebra problem, and then we'll talk through this a second together. All right. X plus one equals seven. If X plus one equals seven, then X is? See, you guys are great at algebra. This is, this is not hard. What's the, big What's the big problem? Well, hold on to that a second. We'll get to that in a second. My family recently got a bunny. And when I say a bunny, we didn't get a rabbit. A rabbit's like a real animal. We got a bunny. He's not sure he's even, not a person. I think he thinks he's a person. He's a little bit spoiled. Like, like he'll go to sleep. They'll hold him like that, and he'll fall asleep. And he'll snore. I mean, it's, it's crazy. He'll just, he's just a spoiled little mess. He likes to crawl up inside of clothing to get warm and cozy. I'm not even, I, I think he doesn't know he's an animal. Like, I think he thinks he's a person. He really does. So question, this is Mango, by the way, our bunny, Mango. We named him Mango because we weren't sure if he's a boy or a girl when we got him. We thought Mango's kind of gender neutral. It'd be <laughs> fine either way. All right, so do you think Mango could solve X plus 1 equals 7? No. Does that mean there's not an answer? No, it means he's a bunny. He, bunnies can't solve algebra. 
They can't do that. Algebra is a higher form of thinking than his little rabbit brain can get his mind around. So sometimes in our world, God wrestles with complex realities that I can't get my little brain around. That doesn't mean there's not an answer. It means I'm not God. And it also means that I can assure us that even though we may not find an answer, our hope will not be a disappointment. Because God has shown us already, again and again, how much He loves us, how much He cares for us, and He's never going to let us down. He may never tell you the answer. He, you might not be able to understand it if He did. You may just have to trust Him. And sometimes, and I don't mean this, I don't mean this flippantly, sometimes in the middle of us trusting God when we don't understand something, those are the moments we grow the most. I want to challenge you to surrender your right to know why it is that you're suffering. Secondly, I want to challenge you to surrender your right to know how long you're going to suffer. Have you ever had these thoughts about difficulties? Like, I could, under, I could handle it if I just knew when it was going to end. Like, I can endure anything if I know when it's going to start and end. Have you ever thought that? I do that. So, like, may you get a diagnosis and it's bad. But if you knew, if the doctor could give you 100% certainty, here's six months of treatment, and then on the other end of that, completely healed, no problems ever again. You could do that. Or if that was your diagnosis, that wouldn't be a big deal. It's the unknowing that you don't know. We're going to try this, and that may work, and it may take longer. We don't. Or let's say you're in a difficult marriage. And if you knew this time next year, we're in a completely different spot. We're praising God for saving our marriage. Everything's great. God is good. You could do that. I mean, it's a tough year, but you can get around this. Or let's say you've got a wayward child, or you're in serious financial trouble. If you knew you're going to reunite, re reunite with your kid on June 11th, or you get a huge promotion on July 18th, you could, you could wait that out. You could survive the pain until June 11th or July 18th. I mean, you could do that. It's the, it's the unknown that gets us, right? But that's not how this works. We may not know the timetable that we're on, but we do know the one we're following. And, th and that gives us great comfort. We can trust Him. And our hope in God will not lead to disappointment. But we may not know what the timing is. Florence Chadwick uh, was a swimmer in the 1950s. Her biggest contribution to the swimming, sport of swimming was on August the 8th when she swam the English Channel, setting the world record at the time in 13, minutes, 13 hours and 20 minutes. Let me say that again. She swam straight for 13 hours and 20 minutes. Like My arms are tired just thinking about 13 hours and 20 minutes. A year later, she, she set the record again by swimming this time from England to France, which apparently is harder. I don't know why that's harder. Something about the currents, I don't know. So this time, the record was 16 hours and 22 minutes. She's the first woman to swim both directions of the English Channel, and at that point in 1951, had the record go in both directions. Impressive. One year later, 1952, she attempted to swim from Catalina Island to the California coastline. 26 miles from Catalina Island to the California coast. So when she started, it was a nice day. She had a boat on either side of her. They were uh, friends and supporters. Also some, some uh, people to make sure she actually did the record. Had some medical personnel in case she got hurt or something. They were also watching for sharks. I mean, for heaven's sakes, she had people watching for sharks as she swam. Anyway, she's swimming uh, 26 miles from one to the other. She swam for 15 hours straight, was doing great, and then a thick fog set in. Not like a wispy fog, like a deep pea soup type, couldn't always see the boats right beside her type of fog. And if you've ever done any distance things, uh, you know you can get inside your brain in those moments. So 15 hours in, she's swimming, she begins to doubt her ability, and she begins to call out to her mom who's in one of the boats, just get me out, I can't do it, it's not my day. And her mom's like, no, you can do it. No, I just can't, I can't do it. As she's swimming. No, you can do it. Keep, keep going. Keep going. For an hour, they went back and forth pleading with her. You can do this. You've trained for this. You want this. I know you're going to be disappointed if you get out. You can just do it a little longer. I can't do it. Finally, after an hour of the back and forth, after a little over 16 hours of swimming, they pull her out of the water and put her in the boat. They went to the coastline, and she realized later that after 16, over 16 hours of swimming, she, they pulled her out less than 20 minutes to go from the shoreline. Less than 20 minutes. She told a reporter later, all I could see was fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. Can I just, and I, I really do mean this gently, can I just ever so gently prod your thinking for just a minute? If you're in the middle of something, you don't need one more thing telling you something wrong. Can I just gently nudge you a minute? 
If this is you, if you're saying, I'm in the middle of something, and I could deal with it if I knew when it was going to stop, if that's you, your struggle may not be philosophical or theological, you know, why does God allow suffering? Your struggle may be a control issue. It's, it's, like, it's like I'm saying to God, God, if you would have included me in on the details, I'd be okay with it. And he doesn't always. You and I may not know the why, and we may not know the how long, but we know the who, and we can trust the who. If you're in the middle of it right now, and you don't know how long this is going to last, and you're feeling tired, and you're seeing fog, uh, so to speak, let me give you a couple scriptures that may help. Jesus in Matthew 28 said, I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. So on a day like today, when you're struggling, when you're feeling hard, down and tired, I want you to know that even if you may not feel the presence of God as strongly as you would other days, it's important to remember that He is still with you. You don't have to ask God to be with you. He already said He would be. So He is. He promised to be with you, so you can be confident. You know, when I pray, when I'm, when I'm helping somebody at a funeral or in a hospital or going through serious situations, I often will pray that God would help them to feel His presence. I don't ask God to be with them because God already said He would be. I just say, God, will you help them feel you? Will you help them to experience you and see you in the middle of all this mess? Because sometimes the painful realities of this dark world make, it, make him hard to see. So I pray that blinders get taken off, not that he's there. He already said he'd be there. Hebrews 13 says, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So not only did Jesus say he'll be with us always, in Hebrews it says that God's promise will never go away. He'll never renege on that promise. He'll always be faithful. He'll always come through. God is always at work, always working to redeem this broken world and make it whole again, even when it stinks like it may right now for you. He has not left us. He has not left you. He never will. First Peter chapter 5 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. If you're in the middle of this, that, those three words, in due time, I don't know when that is. But humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on God because he cares for you. When you feel like you don't understand or you can't go on, like you don't have the strength to do what lies just in front of you, I want you to rest assured that you don't have to. You don't have to be strong enough or together enough or smart enough all on your own because God is strong enough and smart enough and together enough for both of you. God has promised to be with us. God has promised to never leave us. So we can rest, not under the weight of the world, but under the protective hand of God. Humble yourselves under his mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. He is still with you and he still cares. You and I may not know the why, we may not know the how long, but we know the who and we can trust him. So surrender your right to, to know why you're suffering. I want to challenge you to surrender your right to know how long you're going to suffer. But most importantly, I want you to ask you to surrender to God in the midst of your suffering. This is the big one. This is the most important one. H.G. Wells wrote a short story uh, years ago called The Country of the Blind. Some of you may have read that. Uh, it's kind of a famous short story. In the story, he introduced us to the lead character, a guy named Nunez, who was climbing a steep mountain in Ecuador. As he's climbing, he, he slipped and he caught some gravel and slid down this ravine, down into a... a a canyon that had been created by an earthquake, Wells says, years earlier. So the, the canyon was completely isolated from the rest of the world. People in the canyon couldn't get out, and mostly people didn't know the canyon was even there. So there's a whole village of people, villagers, inside this canyon that the world didn't know was there, and they didn't know the world existed other than their little canyon. And for some reason, the, the events of the thing happened where uh, there was a weird illness, a, a virus of strain in that canyon. So when newborn children were born, they would quickly lose their eyesight. So no, nobody could see. And it had been going on long enough, that Wells writes, that not only could none of them see, they didn't know anybody who could ever see, and they didn't know anybody who ever knew anybody who could ever see. It had been going on for years. So Nunez slips down into this canyon and finds himself in the country of the blind. The entire community. He said he, there was houses there and the houses didn't have windows. Because why would you have windows if the whole country was blind? The paths and the, and the, the sidewalks and things all had curbs on the side so that people could find their way and, and not slip off the edges. Everything around them was designed for sightless living because they didn't know any other way. 
They had adapted to it for so long they had forgotten the sight. Imagine Nunez began to tell them of this wonderful fifth sense. They knew about hearing and smelling and tasting and touching. They didn't know anything about seeing. They didn't know it existed. And so Nunez, who could see, was saying, yeah, but you've got to understand there's this other fifth sense. And they just determined he was crazy because no, no one knows anything about this sight business. He's just manipulating us. He didn't see anything. And so they began to tell him to quit talking about it, and he couldn't help it. He just had to tell them about this idea of sight. And they're like, no, you're crazy. And finally they told him, you have an unstable obsession with this idea of sight. You need to drop it or we're going to kick you out of our island. It was a fantasy to them. You know, if this world is all there is, if this world is meaningless and death is final, then suffering is just random. It's a destructive force that should grip us all with fear. We should live with anxiety and regret and doubt and all this stuff of what's ahead because they're just sufferings going to come to all of us. But if there's a God who loves us, who's watching over us, then our sight, our awareness of Him, will provide us perspective even when the world around us just can't see. Even when the world around us does not have faith and it doesn't make sense to them of what we're saying we see. It may not make sense to anyone else. But it gets clear to us because we know there's more to this world than what meets the eye. We can see it. And the Bible says we have to hone that spiritual vision and really keep it in place or we're going to lose it, especially in the midst of suffering. Colossians chapter 3 says, Since then we have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above. That word set, your, set is from the Greek word, Zeteo. And that word is used a lot, and I think often it's translated a little bit different than this. It's used in Matthew 18 when Jesus was talking about the farmer searching for his lost sheep. It's used in Luke 15 when talking about the widow looking frantically for her lost coin. It's used in Matthew 13 talking about the merchant who was out searching desperately for fine pearls. In all three of those passages, it describes God's love for us, who's searching for us, pursuing us, passionately going after us. And it's the same word they used in Mark 16 when the, when the people went to the tomb and the tomb was empty and they were searching around frantically to find the body of Jesus because he wasn't in the tomb because he was alive. Now apply that idea back to Colossians chapter 3. When it says set your hearts on things above, set your minds on things above, it's not this picture of just kind of apathetically, casually thinking about heaven or God or stuff. It's about passionately pursuing the things that are spiritual, the things that are beyond, the things that are of God. Even if that means distracting ourselves from some of the things that are here, we must set our hearts and our minds on things above to passionately look for God, to frantically search Him out, even when things down here vie for our attention. And Scripture says that we do this because it's a natural tendency to not do that. Over time, we lose our sight. We can become part of the country of the blind, and we don't even know God's there. We have a tendency, I have a tendency, to get frantic about the things down here, so much so that I get distracted about the things going on up there. I lose my sight. Colossians 3 continues in verse 3. It says, For we died, and our life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. And where is Christ? It said earlier, Christ is at the right hand of God. Our, our, our citizenship is now not here. Our citizenship is now in heaven. We're, we're not citizens of this place. And that should change the way that we have fear. That should change the way we have offense. That should change the way we have doubts. Scripture says that when we're baptized, we're clothed with Christ. Our citizenship is not here. It's in heaven. This world is not our home. And now my rights change. My perspective changes. Because this is not it. Let me give you an example. Let's say you went on a cruise. And you know how cruises work. You go a while and then you land, go to a port of call and, you land, and then you come out and go to a while and go to a port of call. Let's say one of the port of calls was an exotic island. And it was like the centerpiece of the whole cruise. Everybody's looking forward to this exotic island. And a couple weeks before you go on the trip, the, the, you get an email from the cruise people saying, now, just wanted to let you know, this island's a little bit weird, so you've got to wear a coat and tie or like a formal dress if you're at this island because that's just how they do it. So they're really uptight. They're really kind of, so just plan on bringing a coat and tie for that day because that's, that's what you've got to wear. Okay. You'd say, okay, I'll bring a coat and tie. I want to go to this exotic island. That's what I'll do. You can handle it for a couple of hours. It's not a big deal. 
It would be totally different if Congress passed a law saying we had to wear a coat and tie and a formal dress 24-7. You'd say, now where's my rights? I'm an American citizen. You don't have the right to tell me what to do. I'm going to wear whatever I want to wear, right? We get all upset about that. But for an exotic island for a couple of hours, that's fine. It's not our home. Our offense is totally different if this is home. The Bible says this is not home. This is not how it should be. It's not going to be how it should be. This is not home. One glad morning, when this life is over, we're going to fly away, the old song says, and then we'll be home, and then things will be right, and then things will be as they're supposed to be, but not here. We're just visiting here. When you and I set our hearts and our minds on God, He gives us strength and encouragement to get through the trials of this life. Tim Keller says it's a little bit like having shocks on your car. Keller says a shock absorber system in a car doesn't eliminate the bumps in a road. It keeps the car from being shaken apart. And if you're on a bumpy stretch of road right now, you need all the faith you can muster. It won't eliminate the bumps. It'll just hold you together. In the spring of 1994, Immaculate Ilibagaza, you can't say it either, don't make fun of me. She was, she was a Rwandan student, an engineering student, and was home on break from college in her small village uh, in Rwanda. On April the 6th of that year, the Rwandan president was assassinated by someone from the Tutsi tribe, of which Immaculate's family was a part. So the Hutus, there's kind of two tribes in that, community, in that country, the Hutus and the Tutsis. The, the Tutsis assassinated the Hutu president, and so the Hutus, in response, were going to take revenge on every Tutsi they could find. And so they began to go village to village, home to home, killing, raping, torturing any Tutsi they could find. Hundreds of raiders began to go house to house, village to village, slaughtering men, women, and children who, who belonged to that other tribe. Hundreds of raiders, not just with guns, but with machetes and knives. It was violent. It was ugly. It was a blot on humanity, the likes that we've rarely seen. Immaculate's father could see what was coming, and so he sent her to a local pastor who actually was part of the other tribe, thinking that she would be a little safer. They wouldn't search his house as much. He's part of them. And also, he's a pastor, so he'd have compassion. And he asked, asked the pastor to hide her in his home. She went to the home. He did hide her in a three-foot by four-foot bathroom that was hidden inside of his house, and she was there with seven other women. So eight women inside of a 12-square-foot bathroom. They stayed there mostly silently for fear of being discovered for 91 days. For perspective, 91 days ago was January the 29th. So if you'd gone into hiding January 29th, you'd be coming out today out of a 12-square-foot bathroom with seven other women. And all the while, they're hearing unspeakable horrors all outside the windows, outside the house. They're hearing screams and violence and death all around them. When she emerged after 91 days, she weighed only 65 pounds. She walked outside to see hundreds of bodies all across the streets, spread out from where the violence had hit. And she learned that except for her brother, who was studying overseas, all the rest of her family had been killed. She was the only one who, in country who was left. Almost a million people were murdered in 91 days. Neighbors, friends, extended family, all this terrible violence from this one tribe against her tribe. And she had to wrestle with all of that. Her response is phenomenal. She, she writes, definitely my experience, I, I lived through the genocide, have helped me be more resilient. You can tell a little bit of broken English. Resilient in a way of trusting God, trusting that no matter how much the situation can be bad, there's always hope. Even when I don't see an answer, I just do my part. I hold on to God. There's always hope, she says. She says that her faith in God gave her the strength and hope in those dark moments inside of that bathroom. Her faith in God gave her strength as she emerged from that bathroom and began to process the events of those days, and it still today gives her strength to face the obstacles that she comes across. She spoke extensively about forgiveness, how God led her to forgive, and if she hadn't had that, she couldn't have survived the, the transition. She says it's really about forgiveness and to realize that forgiveness does not mean making yourself a victim. That's huge. Forgiveness belongs to you, the person who's been hurt, and sometimes reconciliation follows. Sometimes. So, suffering, I've come to believe, suffering is a little bit like exercise for your soul. It's hard, it's painful, it, it feels like a struggle, 
but you come out on the other side a completely different person. I don't say this lightly. I don't say this to suggest that God causes all the pain of the world to stretch us, that God's yelling at you and making things happen to make your life terrible. I'm not saying any of those things, but I am suggesting we're living in a broken world, and God uses the moments of those worlds to, to bring us along and strengthen us, and on the other side of the struggle, our souls have, will have grown for it. Suffering is exercise for the soul. In fact, l- listen to some. She does conferences now, Immaculate, all over the world. Listen to, to a conference goer describe meeting her. He says, When you meet Immaculate, there's just a presence about her. You see a radiance. She shines. It's not within her, it's without. And after the retreat, I remember thinking, It's very apparent that she's been touched by God. And it's very apparent she was left to tell her story. Her story is riveting, given the extreme hatred and, and the evil people experienced. Then turning it around and experiencing the forgiveness and love, the world needs to look at Rwanda because if they can heal, it's possible for any person, any situation to heal. Suffering is exercise for the soul. And when you suffer, whether it's the death of someone close to you or a terrible diagnosis or a financial loss or a struggling relationship, when you suffer, you have two options. You can, you'll be tempted to, be, to run away from God. to to get all up inside your head of the why and the how and how long and and run away from God in the process. Or you can run to God in the middle of that. And if you run to God in the middle of that, He will draw you close and He will give you strength and He will shield you from, from the worst parts of that. And in due time, He will lift you up. He promised to do so. I was reading some things from Tim Keller to, to prepare for this, and, and he had an interesting angle on Scripture, which I thought might be helpful for us to finish. He says, you look in the Garden of Eden, and God creates this, this lush, amazing garden, and it has streams of water flowing and fruit trees and all this amazing vegetables, and he puts, and there's no weeds. It's beautiful. And he puts Adam and Eve there in the garden to tend the garden, to enjoy the garden, and enjoy him and each other, and they're there, and, and Satan slithers along in the form of a snake and says... God doesn't really love you. Don't trust God. He doesn't really love you. Trust me. I'll show you. And the world is broken. And you see that same pattern over and over again. And today, when we suffer, Satan slithers up to us and he says, God doesn't love you. Don't trust God. He doesn't love you. Trust me. I'll show you. And on the cross, God gave us the only definitive answer for the world. God said definitively, I really do love you. You really can trust me. I really do understand suffering, and I'm willing to go through that for you because I really do love you, and you really can trust me. We may not know the why on this side of heaven. We may not know the how long, but we know the who, and we can trust him 